Equipping yourself with the armor of God, a practical guide. In your spiritual journey as a believer, the concept of equipping yourself with the armor of God stands as a vital and indispensable protection for your soul, your heart, and your mind. Hey Frank, you want to hear a joke? Shoot. You want to hear a fast one? Yeah. You want to hear another one? <sighs> Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Understanding this practical guidance given to us by God is a resource designed to offer clear steps or instructions for accomplishing specific tasks and achieving specific goals, that is, ultimately defending yourself against the wiles of the devil. Just as a warrior prepares for battle with a physical armor, you, the believer in Christ, is called to arm yourself spiritually against unseen forces of darkness. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians presents a timeless and practical framework for believers to fortify themselves against wicked spiritual adversaries. The metaphorical armor described in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 will prove to be a comprehensive list of protective gear that transcends time and space, offering you insights to the greatest personal protection into how you can stand firm in the face of adversity, temptation, and spiritual warfare. It's an armor used in this earthly realm to protect yourself against spiritual wickedness in this world from the spiritual realm. A world that exists but no one can see but feel, and very few can see it. Only those that have had these encounters know what I'm talking about. Whatever the challenges of life are, know that you have the assurance that with the armor of God you are well protected and well prepared for the battles that lie ahead. God through Paul's hand, he gives you, the believer in Christ, a spiritual armor to protect yourself with. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, start reading in verse 10, Finally my brethren, so Paul is writing to the believers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The believer in Christ finds his strength in the Lord and not in himself. Many have been humbled when they went in the power of their earthly strengths. Man forgets that he came from dust and ultimately your destination will be back to the dust. And in case you forgot, God told Adam and he's also reminding you. And in Genesis 3.19 it says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. I'd like to take the spiritual application of Psalm 18. Start reading in verse 1. I love thee, O Lord, my strength. So here David is not ascribing his strength. He says, O Lord, my strength. He's making the Lord his strength. A true believer in Christ will always rely and lean on the Lord because that's where true strength is. Man in himself, he doesn't have that capacity. It is the Lord that actually protects you. We saw that when we were studying in Job, how he puts a hedge and angels run about you. Verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower verse 3 I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from mine enemies now these include fleshly as well as spiritual enemies verse 32 now it is God that girdeth or surrounds me with strength and maketh my way perfect. It is the Lord that gives you anything and everything that you need. Once a believer in Christ starts understanding this, this is where the humbleness comes in. Pride, ego leaves, you're becoming humble before the Lord. Now Paul explains why we need to put on this armor. In verse 11 of Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now the word wiles means to deceive, to delude. So Satan will throw all kinds of stuff to deceive you and to delude you. To delude basically means to lead from truth into error. That is his job. If you look at the Bible versions today, it is crazy what's happening out there. From a truth, we ended up going to error. The doctors, the scholars, and the theologians, they're gonna, yeah, but you don't know manuscript evidence. Well, I don't have to go to school to be educated to the level of imbecility because some of the stuff that comes out of these guys' mouths sometimes is just hallucinating because they say stuff that actually goes against Scripture and there's just one verse to just cut them down at the knees. So to delude means to lead from truth to error, to mislead the mind or judgment. And this is what Satan is actually doing to mankind. Now, putting on God's spiritual armor will help you stand against being deceived, deluded, lied to, led into temptation, distracted from God's will. How about being protected from false teachings and heresies? 
These are all the doings of Satan. He has his ministers working, believe it or not, in the churches. But listen to their message. Somebody who's saved, somebody who's in Christ, you're going to notice that there's something wrong with this message. So Paul continues explaining why we need this armor. By revealing the nature and source of the evil spiritual forces we are up against. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against our fellow man. Because the fellow man that's coming against you, he's being affected by the spirit behind them. If he would give himself to prayer, to reading, to meditation of God's word, he would never be led of whatever forces, whatever evil forces are actually behind them. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is what we're fighting. We're fighting things that we can't see. How do you fight something that you can't see? I call on my God who nobody's ever seen and he's going to be the one that's going to be fighting these battles for me. So with this explanation, Paul commands the believers now to take on and put on the armor that God actually supplied. Having this armor will help you block resist when your trial and temptations come. You'll be able to stop it. You'll be able to resist it because God says that you could resist it. But if you're falling for that temptation, this is what Satan wants. And God wants you to sort of like stand and resist the temptation. God gives you the tools. It's up to you to grab the tools and to actually put them to work. It's like the carpenter. He gets to work. He's got the tools. He's got the chisels. He's got the planers. He's got everything but he's not using it. You are a worthless carpenter. And if Satan comes against you, he's going to flatten you out. And then what? Don't blame it on God. He says, I gave you the tools. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand, and the word withstand here means to oppose or to resist, that you're able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Now the evil day is your day of temptation. Everybody has his day. And this thing doesn't happen only once. We are constantly hit with it. The stronger, more solid you are in Christ, the more sometimes it just keeps coming against you. We've got something that God's given us that Satan would not be able to erode. But because we're still in the flesh, that's where Satan's hope is. Because if you're given to the flesh and you're not given over to the spirit, you are going to fall. As Jesus had his temptation in his time and trial he had it in the wilderness that was his time it's recorded in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 how did Jesus resist Satan he kept saying it is written for you to be able to say it is written this is going to be a little bit of homework on your part for you to memorize a verse when the temptation or the trial comes in you actually spit it out again he has to leave that is the law that God laid down on the devil and Satan so the evil day is that point in time that you are going to be going through. The context of having done all to stand suggests that after you have put on God's armor to oppose and resist spiritual wickedness in your time of trial and temptation, you after that trial should be standing. If you're not standing, take note, why did I fall? Oh, I fell because of this particular lust that I had in my heart and that's why I got sucked into it. Let me put that aside. Some of the lusts that you might have inside you are so gripping, it just grabs you and it's just pulling you. You know how hard that is? I go through that too. As much as possible, learn God's Word, memorize, meditate on God's Word, and watch what's going to happen in your life. You are going to be strengthened. If you feed the flesh, the flesh is going to win. If you feed the Spirit, the Spirit is going to win. And if you find yourself in a situation that you don't like where you're at, look at your walk. What are the thoughts coming in through your mind? What is it that your flesh is so hard and desiring? It's like the person that wants to lose weight, the person that wants to get off of drugs, the person that wants to get off of pornography, the person that wants to get off of whatever it is that your flesh is so strong in. I lost 40 pounds. You think it was easy? Did you know that in a weekend I can gain 10 pounds for how much I eat? I've got a heavy appetite. I got to keep myself from food. There are certain foods I extremely love. There's the temptation, but I turn around and says, no. How bad do you want it? That is the question that you have to ask yourself. To stand means to remain steadfast, unwavering, and resolute in the face of challenges and whatever temptations that you're being hit with. To stand means to complete your trial and temptation, persevering and standing firm in the truth and principles of your faith in Christ despite adversity. How much do you value the relationship 
relationship between you and your God. In the next verses, Paul begins naming the seven pieces of armor and uses the imagery of a Roman soldier's armor to illustrate the spiritual armor that believers should be wearing in their battle against evil spiritual forces. They are there. I've already been there, done that. It is the ugliest thing to walk into a room. My skin is starting to crawl. The only thing I would pray, Lord, protect me. Three words, and all of a sudden, it's sort of like, oh, everything just dissipates. I don't know what happened. I just said, Lord, protect me. And whatever it was, left. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to look at the first part of this verse now. So Paul begins with the first piece of armor. Your loins girt about with truth. What does that mean? It was believed in ancient times that the loins, which was situated between your pelvis below the ribcage, was where the mind resided. So they believed that the mind was in this area here. So question, what does having your loins girt mean? What does that mean? Having or getting your mind ready and alert for any dangerous situation. Vocabulary.com says gird means to get ready for a dangerous situation. To gird is to prepare for a military attack. But more loosely, it refers to readying yourself for any kind of confrontation. That's what the word gird means. Girding your loins about with truth. You're getting yourself ready for whatever confrontation is coming. So when you gird for something, you are preparing for the worst case scenario. So gird can also mean fasten something tightly with a belt or band. It's like putting a belt and just tying it on tight. As gird on your loins, that means tie the belt around your loins, which is this area here. Or it can mean to surround or encircle. You prepare now your mind, back then, but you prepare your mind and secure your mind with truth. And that's having your mind dipped in truth and only pure truth. This is the powerful formula. Once you have the pure truth, there is nothing that's going to stop you because you're going to be settled in your mind. You're going to be settled. You're going to be confident because you know that you're actually getting it from a solid source. So this is the powerful formula. God's word is truth. You'll find this in John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them for thy word is truth. In other words, your loins girt about with truth means your loins, your mind, is always ready and continually prepared with truth for any dangerous situation attacking you. So in the context of having your loins girt about with truth, it emphasizes the importance of truth as a foundational element of spiritual preparedness. To be spiritually prepared is for you to know the truth, assimilate it, understand it. Should something happen, you're able to dish it out. A question is asked, you'll be able to actually answer the question. So this means having a firm understanding of biblical truths and doctrines. Now, for example, if I say Trinity, two major camps are going against it. I'm going to say Rapture, two major camps are going against it. The deity of Christ, two major camps going against it. But truth is exclusive. You could only have one truth. And yet, you've got massive peoples on both sides. But somebody's got to be wrong. Who's wrong? But everybody's got their verse. But then you start really checking it out and they're twisting scripture like there's no tomorrow. Twisting is good if you're dancing to the music, but not when you're reading scripture. Don't do that. This truth that you have in your mind and heart is not uncertainty or having any doubt of any truth that you have or having lack of clarity. You have the truth, you're clear about it, you understand it, you're able to actually explain it. How many believers, how many Christians so-called, they cannot explain the foundations of Christianity? They cannot. Do you know why? And I know because I've been in some of these churches. The fluff that they've been fed has mushed their brains. And when you're talking to them, I'm embarrassed to be called a Christian, so I don't call myself a Christian anymore. I call myself a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in His death, burial, and and resurrection. That's the Jesus Christ that I'm believing in. The truth that you have is a settled conviction, knowing whom and what to believe, established as your solid foundation. Jesus equipped the body of Christ with five ministerial offices ordained by Jesus in Ephesians 4.11, which the church has experienced for the last 2,000 years. So these ministerial roles were established in verse 12, and the reason of its institution is found in verse 14. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth, speaking of the believers, be no more children tossed 
us to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. For this to happen, your mind has to be settled in truth, so you're not carried about with every wind of doctrine. So Jesus' mind was ready and prepared with the truth that was found in Scripture when He faced Satan, this is the job that you have to do. So instead of watching a half hour sitcom, take a half hour, just read, just study. You look at the Bible, oh, this is way too much for me. It's easy to scare anybody away. How do you learn? It's one element at a time. So in a spiritual sense, having one's loins girt about with truth symbolizes being securely grounded in and guided by the truth of God's Word through the guidance of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth in the spiritual context means being firmly rooted and grounded in the truth of God's teachings and His principles. It signifies a commitment to living in accordance with God's truth and relying on it as a source of strength, protection, and guidance in your spiritual battles of life. We all go through that. Jesus, who was God manifest in the flesh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God in John 1, 1, and the Word was made flesh. He came down. He was tempted the same way that we are. So at the judgment, you can never point the finger. You don't know what it was like with the drugs, with the food, with the whatever it is, with the sex. Some people are just over whatever. You don't know what it was. No, no. I was there. I've been there, done that. Like I managed to pass through it. You had the opportunity, but you gave in to the lust of your flesh. So don't point the finger. You're guilty. And there's no way that you're going to get out of that particular judgment. In verse 14 now, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. The second part, and having the breastplate protects the chest area, and that is all the vital organs necessary for living in a physical body. The breastplate of righteousness is necessary for living in the next life in a spiritual body. Righteousness is the fulfillment of the law. The second death has no jurisdiction on your soul. Sin was the doorway through which death came into the world and passed upon all men. In Romans chapter 5 verse 12 it says, Wherefore, as by one man, speaking of Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So all those in the body of Christ automatically have this righteousness gifted to them under the gospel of grace. Because of this gift, protection is afforded in this life and in the one to come against spiritual wickedness and death. This spiritual breastplate of righteousness that He gives you protects you down here, but this is something for the next life. Death has no jurisdiction over you and Satan cannot even approach you. This is what we're supposed to be wearing. So when he attacks you, remember this sin, remember that sin? It's all been paid 2,000 years ago. It's already been put under the blood. Jesus Christ, He's the guy that paid my debt. Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offense, again speaking of Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. We have a gift that's given to us under the gospel of the grace of God. It's not under the gospel of the kingdom. It's not under the everlasting gospel. Verse 15, And your feet shod with the preparation, or the readiness, of the gospel of peace. The word shod, I got this from OxfordLearningDictionaries.com. Shod means wearing shoes of the type mentioned. Collins Dictionary. Shod is used when you are describing the kind of shoes that a person is wearing. So in verse 15, the kind of shoes that the believer is given to wear is prepared or pre-ready with the gospel of peace. If you go back to the verse, and your feet shod with the preparation, the readiness of the gospel of peace. So that means the shoes that you're wearing is the preparation of the gospel of peace. But it evidently appears to be designed in a particular manner to point out the preparation or the readiness which the gospel makes for our defense. So believing the gospel, that is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the covering of your feet to make you stand and also to walk when it's time. These shoes are a most solid foundation. Your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace is what gives you the propulsion to stand as well to go forward to carry its message to the world. So being able to give out the gospel means you understand it for yourself first and every facet of it to be able to give it out. What does Isaiah 52 7 say? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good that publisheth salvation.
that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. In Romans 5, 1 it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. This is what we're proclaiming to the world. The gospel of peace is the justification by faith, procuring peace with God through Jesus. Peace is freedom from agitation or disturbances. By the passions, you're free from fear, terror. You're free from anger, anxiety, death, hell, and the like. Peace is a freedom from war, from internal commotions of civil war, private quarrels, suits, disturbances. Peace is freedom from anything that would disrupt the quietness, the tranquility, or the calmness of your mind. It's not attacking me, and only the Lord Jesus Christ can give you that. Freedom is anything that would disrupt the quiet of your conscience. Once your conscience is attacked, you don't have peace anymore. There's warfare going on. And the only thing to fight this warfare is for you to have your nose dipped in that book. Don't try to guess what's in the Bible. It doesn't work. Oh, the guy, I remember the guy saying something like along those lines. No, why don't you read it word for word? At least you're going to know exactly what it is. You must remove any counterfeit shoes that gives you a false sense sense of peace given to us by the world and given to us by the devil which is not true peace although they may offer a temporary comfort stability that worldly peace will not be able to stand in the day of testing what did Jesus say in John chapter 14 verse 27 peace I leave you my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. So the world is giving a certain type of peace. And Jesus is saying, my peace is different from the one of the world. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So there's two types of peace that you can actually get out there. Which one are you going to go after? The devil, Satan, the world. It's sugar-coated and there's a cherry on top. Very, very alluring. Which one do you want? That's the question you should be asking yourselves. The gospel brings stability to your mind and readiness for spiritual battle. Once you've got this peace, you know who you're standing on, which that foundation is Jesus Christ. Who are you going to fear? I'm going to fear the one that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's the one I'm going to be fearing, not man. You put your trust and faith in the Lord. Let's go back to verse 16 in Ephesians 6. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This piece of the armor is most necessary in this present life. The defensive role of faith as a shield against the attacks of the enemy are crucial. They're undeniable and indispensable. It emphasizes the protective and empowering nature of faith and spiritual warfare. Faith won't be needed when you will be in God's sight because He's going to be standing right in front of you. Faith is the main ingredient that moves God. Faith is what unlocks God's promises to you and activates His Word in your life. In Hebrews 11:6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. You want to please God? Go to God in faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists, that he is there, that he hears and he answers prayer, and that he is a rewarder of them, the believer, that diligently seeks him. This is where the relationship comes in. Hey God, uh, listen, uh, you know, I pulled a little genie out of my pocket. I need to, you know, rub him a little bit. I need this, I need, okay, thank you. And then I put him back in my pocket. It says diligently seek him. I talk to God 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 times a day. How many people are in the hospitals? They're not diligently seeking the Lord. They're throwing a couple of prayers here and there. God does answer out of his mercy and grace. And then you just forget about him. These are the guys you want to give them a backhander. Faith in God from your heart and mind becomes the activating ingredient for your source of strength, peace, and guidance, which is found in God's Word. Faith is what brings God's promises to life. Without faith, these promises are worthless in your life. They're just a bunch of printed words in the Bible. That's it. It's like soap. Without water, soap can't do anything in its dried condition. The water is what activates that soap to perform. So faith is what activates God's promises in your life. You don't have that faith, it ain't working. So once your faith in God is established, faith will act as a shield against the enemy's attacks. This faith is grounded in God's promises. Faith carries with it trust and confidence in God's word. Basically what he has declared to you. Once your faith is established, you will surrender your will and intellect to God. His ways are higher than my ways. His understanding is much higher than my understanding. I could only go so far. 
God's most ridiculous, stupidest thing that he can ever do is so far above me that to us that is the highest kind of wisdom. You start trusting his guidance and provision even when circumstances seem uncertain and even challenging. Faith is the foundation of your spiritual life as it forms the basis of a relationship between you and your God. Once you start understanding this, your relationship starts taking another turn that a lot of the people, even Christians, believers, they're not even there yet. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith emphasizes the confidence and trust that believers have in God and His promises, even when those promises are not yet fulfilled or even visible in your life. Faith is the foundation of your relationship with God. It's characterized by trust, assurance, and obedience to God's Word. It is nurtured through the study of Scripture and serves as a shield against the assaults of doubt, fear, and temptation. Let's go back to Ephesians 6.17 now. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I'm going to take the first clause here. The helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation represents the assurance of heaven and protection from hell that comes from knowing and believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior. It guards the believer's mind against doubt, fear, and deception. The helmet is an important piece of the armor. It protects the head. Many battles rage in the believer's head. Satan can influence you by attacking you and influencing your thoughts. A second safeguard that goes hand in hand with protecting you from sinning is having God's word hidden in your heart. I'm going to give you the verses for this. In John 13, 2, it says, After supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, he put it into his head. I guess some bad thoughts sometimes but if you are able to say no you just saved yourself from a lot of trouble it is said that an idle mind is the devil's workshop if you have nothing in your mind he'll put something in there for you to work at not for the good but for the bad not for something that might advance your life but something that's going to regress you make you fall into some type of a vice that's why your mind has to be dipped in the scriptures by you having your mind dipped in the scriptures satan's gonna have a hard time getting in there he'll try throwing those darts at you to get those thoughts in your mind. If you're reading, you're meditating on God's Word, Satan will not be able to actually get in there. He'll throw some in, but they'll be bouncing back. In Psalm 119 verse 11 it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So when Satan is throwing you a thought, he's doing it to destroy you eventually. And he starts off very, very slowly. And once he's got you hooked in, whatever vice it is, your goose is cooked. And a lot of people die from it. A lot of people got to go through all kinds of rehab to get out of it but then they stay frail for the rest of their lives better not to have tasted something than to have tasted it and going back to it better not to have tasted what the alcohol tastes like or taking that first hit whatever it is that your body actually desires to say you know what I'm gonna put moderation I'm gonna put a limit on it that takes character that takes a man that takes a solid woman to actually do that salvation protects the believers mind and thoughts this suggests that the assurance and understanding of salvation in Jesus Christ acts as a safeguard for the believers mental well-being here's an explanation the helmet of salvation brings assurance of forgiveness reconciliation with God and eternal eternal life. This is what salvation is going to bring you and it brings in that peace of God that even passes all understanding. This assurance provides peace of mind. It provides comfort, stability, even in difficult circumstances. Understanding salvation in Christ will bring clarity to your thoughts and perspectives on life. It helps you to see yourself and the world through the lens of God's love, His purpose, and His redemption. It protects from deception. Salvation equips the believers with spiritual discernment. The world does not understand this, but the person that's been saved, even for a little while, you start seeing where the discernment comes in. If you are given that you're not a carnal Christian, you're going to start seeing, you're going to start understanding which path to take. The Holy Ghost is there to guide you into all truth. Never forget that. It protects in helping them recognize and resist lies. You're going to know what the lies are, what the temptations are, the negative influences that may assault your mind. Salvation renews your thinking. Salvation involves the transformation of the believer's mind and they are renewed in their thinking and attitudes. I just got the reference in Romans 12 too. Be transformed in your minds. This renewal leads to healthier thought patterns and a more Christ-centered 
mindset. Verse 17, the second part, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit symbolizes the Word of God, which is described as a powerful weapon against spiritual warfare. It is the Word inspired by the Holy Ghost that you use to combat falsehood, temptations, and spiritual attacks. The power of God's Word is represented by the sword. Satan greatly fears this weapon. That's why he attacked it fiercely. Why do you think there's a million and six versions out there? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is Satan's kryptonite. Should something happen, you just spit out the words and you watch him run because he can't take it. This is how you resist Satan. He is powerless when this weapon is used against him. God's Word is an offensive weapon against all spiritual adversities. In Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does Revelation 1.16 say? And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. What was coming out of his mouth? A two-edged sword? No, this is figurative. The word of God was coming out of his mouth and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The best example of its use is found in the devil's temptation against Jesus, again in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. How did that temptation go? It is written, it is written, and then it is written again. And eventually Satan had to give up because he lost. Let's go back to verse 18 in Ephesians chapter 6. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. I don't need to explain this one. This verse says it all. We, in the body of Christ, ought to be praying for one another. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We have to be praying for each other. I want you to watch this three-minute video. This three-minute video is going to secure you with your eternal life. You'll be able to start wearing God's armor against whatever is coming against you. May the Lord guide you, keep you. May the Lord bring us here next week. And if we're not here next week, that means we're going to be somewhere else.